Well, it's great to be here. It's a storm coming. Everything's sort of <laughs> flapping. Um, and well, thank you all for being here. And I was so delighted to interview Romy because I, l I love watching her on TV. She's such a lively, warm, charming person. And she, you know, she's hands-on cook, which I love. And so I have a story to tell you, Romy, yeah. about you were asking me when we were having our little chat. Uh, she said, are there any of my recipes that you've ever cooked? And I said, I won't tell you now, I'll tell you later. <laughs> so I, I love growing vegetables. And I had a glut of courgettes last year. Yeah. And my daughters were fed up of eating courgettes because there's only that many ways you can cook courgettes. And then Romy's on television and she's walking in a field and plucking courgettes and she's making pakoras. And I said, I haven't done that. So we had a feast of pakoras. So thank, thank you for that. You. They're so delicious, aren't they? They're so crispy and, and light. They were crispy. And the way you made it, yeah. those tips were super. So thank we had you. a good tea. <laughs> Yeah. Tea and Kush pakoras are the Kush best. are coming again, right? It's going to be in season now, so you can, Absolutely. Uh, can have a <coughs> recipe. Yep. So we're going to dive straight into this fabulous book, which all of you must go straight to the tent opposite and buy, uh, because it's actually, you know, it's about Kashmir, which we don't hear about that much. You just know Kashmir as conflict, uh, but Romy takes you to the heart of Kashmir to the people, to the place, and it's, it's a travel book as well as a cookbook, yeah. which is just beautiful. So tell me how you started. It was Bollywood films when you were a kid. Yeah. Tell us that story. Um, thank you for having me, um, and I'm so grateful that you guys are here. Um, Kashmir, I think people who are born in India, especially from a very small town, they will know what Bollywood was. At that time when I was growing up, it was a huge affair of black and white television. I, I, don't think the young children will remember that, but it's a huge black and white affair. Um, and we were the first people on our street to have that. And I just fell in love because I grew up in Bengal, which is West Bengal, and to a very Punjabi family. So, um, so it, it was something, the snow, which I had never seen before. And so, you know, you read about it and you see the snow. This Shami Kapoor, who was an actor years ago, <laughs> dancing around the snow. And my fixation of that started from there. And my very Sikh Punjabi husband used to crazy travel on his Lamretta scooter. I don't know how, how many of you know a uh, scooter called Lamretta. And he used to go with his friends to Ladakh, to Kashmir on scooter. So the kind of, I got the opportunity to go with New York Times and then with Suitcase Magazine. And I thought, you know what, why shouldn't I talk about the food, because food is something that connects us, brings us together, um, and even speaks the language when you can't speak the language of that area. And India is such a big country. When people say Indian food, it's not just Indian food, it's very regional food. We come from a, you know, even my mom would cook very differently from my grandma's. So I think I wanted to kind of, sh like you said, when we talk about Kashmir, we talked about the terrorism or we talk about the conflict was going on but I think people like you and me wouldn't want to fight that people want to open their doors and I had to research so much go there so many times I tell you Indian hospitality is amazing but Kashmiri hospitality is another level so it was so good I, 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 I have goosebumps because it was so amazing to kind of connect with the people it's their stories it's not my story it's their stories their food that I ate but I went at the time when COVID was, you know, happening. That book has taken so much out of me mm -hmm. that I, I don't want to write another book for a very long time. <laughs> uh, so I think that was the fascination of writing mm -hmm. food about from yeah. those parts. Yeah. And you insisted on going to the place because that was important. Yes. And you have this wonderful, uh, you know, section where you talk about saffron, which, you know, we, some of us know, some of us don't. So, Tell us about saffron and what it was like to, you know, go pluck the saffron and why it's so special. I think um, Kashmiri saffron is, um, and any saffron, um, it has a really short window, very small, three weeks of blooms, mm -hmm. and you have to go at that time. Um, and also there are some parts in UK, in Cornwall and Kent, they grow their own saffron. Then I've been to, you know, I've tasted the Spanish saffron, Iranian saffron. But I tell you, I, I maybe it's the it's the earth, it's the the soil that makes the Kashmiri 
saffron the best saffron in the world people can say no it's not but i think it is because when you cook with it it's just the flavor the texture the floral um earthy and and sweetness that comes out of it and then also these families who have been growing saffron who have who plucked the saffron um and you know that also now when i met the producers and met the farmers then the saffron which is from iran is getting into kashmir and they're selling it as kashmiri saffron but you know it's kind of a uh, but it but the government the people are doing things which is helping the producers mm -hmm. especially to meet them and they have so much love mm -hmm. talking about and there's a recipe there are many recipes but my favorite is the kawa which is like a tea, the tea. and they don't yeah. drink all the time it's mostly a winter drink but they they drink but kawa is my favorite drink with a lot of saffron with uh, nuts in it yeah. and cardamom and a lot of different spices yeah. that you can uh, drink i've had it in delhi uh, yes. but uh, sadly i've just been to kashmir once it was beautiful but yeah. <laughs> it's so easy to little. to make that at home it's mm. very easy i mean if you can't find kashmiri saffron then use use a different saffron use a different saffron <laughs> yeah and they use the every bit of the saffron so the yellow bit they'll use for something else and then the flowers they used to use a dye so they're not wasting anything mm -hmm. they're using every bit of the and um, you know the saffron but mm -hmm. also the kashmiris especially the muslims use the, each part of the animal from the nose to the tail mm -hmm. they will not waste, waste anything. Up anything and that's brilliant yeah, it is very it? good yeah. if you're going to kill the animal eat the whole eat, thing eat the whole bit yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. so this brings me to you know the the wasban the the kashmiri feast that you describe I and mean, you went to people's homes you went to feasts you went to the field so for those who, here who don't know wasban explain so, what it is so firstly i would say there are three bits in kashmiri so there is a muslim kashmiri muslims mm -hmm. there's kashmiri hindu pandits then there is the bakarwals which are the shepherds mm -hmm. so they, their food is very very different um so the kash the wasman which um sharbani is talking about is is a feast which has a lavish meal from 32 recipes to 52 recipes they will create but when i went um and met the wazas which are the chefs um they were a bit intimidated to see the women um you know coming and this is very much in a male dominating environment but i think as a chef as a writer i made them really calm look i'm not taking anything away from you i just want to learn how you're doing so even grinding the meat so we use blenders here you know we think it's really quick and the, the wazas will never use blenders they use they make this gushtaba and they made this rishta which is like meat balls two mm -hmm. different meat balls um but they'll grind the meat the the grinding the meat makes it like a pate so it pate and then they'll use water and they boil it in water and then they'll cook it with yogurt or they'll cook it with you know uh, kashmiri saffron uh, saffron and then uh, kashmiri chilies mm -hmm. it's very very different but they the way of cooking of kashmiri muslims what i've found is they boil the meat first then when the when they boil the meat the scum comes from the top they'll remove that and they'll use that as a stock stock mm -hmm. so and the and the it's not like a punjabi cuisine which is heavily largely based with butter ghee cream you know it's not like that or not mm -hmm. it's very very broth based mm -hmm. so when you go to kashmiri pandits house where i had a really lavish feast there um through connections and i ate the most amazing vegetarian i thought the punjabis make a very wonderful vegetarian feast mm -hmm. but that was so delicious it's so simple because they use they use they don't really use um uh, uh, most of the people i met kashmiri pandits use they they don't use onions they don't use um garlic okay. but they use ginger powder okay. so that <clears throat> then they will use um asafoetida they don't use which is hing they don't use or and they'll use a lot of yogurt mm -hmm. and a lot of kashmiri chilies that they cook with um but whereas the muslim communities they will use shallots which is called the pran which is you can't find in this country which is more stronger but you can use the shallots but then you go to the bakarwals the up in the mountains the shepherds their cooking is very simple but i will say there's a recipe called hark which mm -hmm. is just collard greens um and so simple so easy to make mm -hmm. and they eat with this maize flour which is the corn flour okay. and makki ki roti type of but they mix it with the uh, other wheat flour and they eat millet flour and they make it it's the most delicious <laughs> heavenly thing you will eat but then you have to become a person like that mm -hmm. you cannot say i know we all know we have castes 
casteism in India. We have, but when you, as a travel writer, you have to become like a person. You have to, um, you know, that's why I quote Mix. Anthony Bourdain because he said, if you want to travel, you have to travel to understand the people. You have to understand the cuisine. You have to become like them. So I think that's why I, I, I mean, the love I got from the people, I write all over India, but I will say I got so much love from them than anywhere else. Oh, that's lovely. And you do your bit. You say, please come back to the valley, you know, yes. come back because of increased tourism, which I really loved. So was there a favorite dish that you had? And is there some dish from here that you'd recommend which people can do I, easily in the kitchen? I, I mean, uh, I write about paneer. I mean, I write, eat a lot of meat and stuff, but I, I write about a paneer dish, which is called, I call it a yellow deliciousness. It's very, very simple. Okay. And nowadays, you can make paneer easily, but you can buy nowadays, very, very easy to buy. Um, but if you, uh, if you make that recipe, it's the bowl of yellow deliciousness. It's so simple, it's so easy to make, who okay. don't you know, know how to make Indian food. It's the one thing I would say to make that. Okay. But then there are so many recipes that are so easy to make. Yeah. Eight, eight to you said. Yeah. And then you didn't stop at Kashmir, you went to Ladakh. I did. What was it like cooking, what, 12,000 feet above sea level? Yeah. I um when I when I went first time to Ladakh I was very very ill with high altitude um, and then a second time it was like this time I was fine because I one day I just rested I said I'm not going anywhere I'm gonna rest a couple of days and then I will travel um, but I, I for me I think um, the what I loved about was going to where the China and the Tibet border is so I think it was going there was Climb, you're not climbing, uh, going through the pass, which is the second highest pass in the world. Mm -hmm. You can only stay there for five to 10 minutes. You cannot stay there longer because you can't breathe then. The oxygen level is um, not much there. But passing that was such, a, such an amazing experience. And then you come, there is, the landscape is so different. Every kilometer the landscape changes. Mm -hmm. And then there's the army. It's all you see is the army people when you go that side. And they were so, they love to see me because there's a woman in there. How is the woman come here? So I, I it was so, they said, they were mm -hmm. so good. They told me stories where to eat, what not to eat. Mm -hmm. But um, they wouldn't let me take any photos with them because they are the army. They said, you cannot take photos, but we'll tell you where to go. Mm -hmm. They were so lovely. Mm -hmm. uh, but going there, especially I would recommend people to go in August because the lake is beautiful, oh. turquoise blue. Mm -hmm. But if you go in winter, then you will just see the snow mm -hmm. um, and the ice. But I think the best time to go is between July and August. And I think you must, must go oh. to those parts of India. And especially, I think, honestly, tourism really needs to be, to needs be ventured there. there. Don't just go to the triangle. Yeah, <laughs> true, true. And just experience the thing. I mean, you, you write about it with so much love that I was like, oh my God, I've got to go. <laughs> it is, oh. it's beautiful. And learning, and <laughs> learning that there is pasta, which I didn't know that yeah. Indian makes pasta yeah. there. Yeah. Um, they make their own dumplings, which I know of, obviously, momos. Mm -hmm. The momos. Uh, yes, exactly. and uh, okay. you know, the palau, which is like the yarkhand palau, which has come from yarkhand in China, and the, how they make that. Um, and mm -hmm. then the buckwheat, buckwheat pancakes, mm -hmm. um, beer, you know, I, I'm, I wasn't a great fan of the beer, uh, but I did <laughs> did try it um, because they drink it warm. I don't know why. Maybe I don't and know. what about yaks cheese? Oh, I love it. That's it good? was fine. Yeah. It was fine. If you can't find that, mm -hmm. I tell you, you can find online, but I shouldn't say where in online. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not promoting anyone, but you can use par Parmesan cheese, so yeah, it's fine. That. Right, right. Okay. So we're going to you know, move from your book now and just get into your life because people would love to know a little more about you, you know, what's behind Romy, the person we see on telly. So you grew up in Bengal. Yeah. And um, when we were talking, uh, you know, backstage, uh, she said, so I'm a Bengali, but I've grown up in Delhi. And Romy is a Punjabi who's grown up in Bengal. Born and brought up. Born in and brought up. So she speaks fluent Bengali. And uh, yeah, we had a nice chat. Yeah. <laughs> because I said, I'm more Punjabi, she's more Bengali. And, uh, so tell me how you know that was how you came here yeah. how did you get a break in what is a very you know very competitive world of uh, food writing television as a woman as an asian woman you know how did you do it so i grew up in a very small town called burnpur which is like isco where my dad worked uh, in a steel plant like a lot of people from all over india came to work there um so i grew up eating like my parents migrated there. So I'm an immigrant here. My daughter's a first generation. So pa my parents went from Punjab 
to work there. My dad was 16 when he went. Money was very tight in our house, but what one thing was very good that um, food was very important. And my dad and my mom made sure we went to English private schools, we went to English medium schools. What they had, you know, not had the opportunity, they wanted us to have that experience. But um, for me, growing up eating Bengali food, Bihari food, which because we were very bordered to the Bihar, Bihar um, and then eating food uh, from uh, South, you know, not just South India, but eating from Andhra Pradesh, Tamil, from Karnataka, from Kerala, from everywhere, and Gujarati. And then dad had friends who have a recipe in there is from Kashmir. Mm -hmm. So I think there were people from all over India. So it's like army. Army kids are very much, very understand of food yeah. and cultures, mm -hmm. they have more better knowledge. So I think I grew up like that. It wasn't just Punjabi food. And I would, I would, I would, I was saying to Sharmani that I'm more Bengali because <laughs> um, my brother is married to Bengali, um, but I'm married to a very Punjabi Sikh <laughs> guy uh, who loves only Punjabi food. But um, I, I love the flavors. I love the Bengali flavors more. Um, I still have very much friends that from, you know, they're, they're from there. But coming here and my mom had cancer. I wanted to always go in hospitality industry. When mom had cancer, she couldn't taste anything. She couldn't taste any flavors. She would put so much salt or chilies. And the moment that, was, that happened, I said to my dad, I want to be a chef. I want to go into hospitality. And he said, no way, because even still now in India, there are a very handful of women chefs, and he said, you won't survive. Um, and I, when I came here, followed my husband, I came here, I said to my husband, sitting on a restaurant years ago, and I said, I want to open a restaurant. I want to go back to the hospitality. I want to learn. That's what I did. Um, you know, I think you need a supportive partner to be able to do that. Um, and uh, I did, but I think opening my own restaurant at the age of 40, and I was 50 last month. Um, so very new 50. <laughs> so 40 opening, but I had to fight for it because A, I was a woman, I was a brown woman. And the, the loans, I tell you, the banks weren't giving any loan. And BBC luckily came to know that I, was, I wanted to open a restaurant and I wasn't getting the funding. And the next day, NatWest gave me a loan. But I sold a lot of my jewelry to open the restaurant because Indian women, you know, Indian families have a lot of jewelry. So I thought, you know what, it's not going to happen. I'm going to do it this way. So I think you have to have that uh, believe. You have to have that passion. really drive. That yeah. not only the passion, but have the drive that you can do this. Mm -hmm. So I did that. I ran the restaurants for many, many years. But I gave up my lease. Was up again after ten years, mm -hmm. um, and I. I just, I just gave, I thought, no, I'm not going to do it. And then the COVID happened immediately. So probably my mom was sitting on my shoulder. She sadly no more. Don't sign it. Don't sign it. So I did not. Um, but I do consult. So that's when the television came. The television just came. And I think I do, I do take opportunities. I sometimes, um, sometimes television wants to tick the boxes. And I tick the box really well. Because I'm a brown woman. I'm of a certain age. So I, when I get the opportunities, I... I'm, I hold it on and I do it well. Like you said, you know, in television, whenever I'm on MasterChef or anything, I, I'm kind to everyone. I cannot be horrible. I cannot, cannot, you know, even if the food is not great, I'll just say it's great. Because I think that um, you have to be nice to people. That's what I think. Right. And, and also writing just came. Mina Holland, who is the editor of Guardian, she gave me the opportunity in 2016 to write for a cook residency, which used to have a cook residence. They've taken that bit out. So I did that writing for one year. And then rest followed, I mm -hmm. think. Absolutely. And uh, of course, people here have seen you on television. You're now on Ready Steady Cook, yeah. cooking in five minutes. I remember <laughs> you telling Ryan, shoo, let me cook. <laughs> you know, I've got to do this. How nerve-wracking is it cooking live on TV? So, um, <laughs> do you know what? I just forget yeah. everything else. I know what I'm going to cook. I'm going to make sure the co contestant who's there, it's about them, it's not about me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to help them, and I create that those dishes. But then I uh, now I do um, more pack lunch, which is Channel 4. Steph's pack lunch. Steph's pack lunch. I do that. And I love doing that because it's just six minutes, and you do it, and you're finished because you know what I have to do. <laughs> I have to only think one thing in my mind, don't swear. Do not swear. Do not swear. I keep that because mm -hmm. I... I, um, I, I, you know, I have daughters watching. I have family watching me. I cannot have that. That kind of drives me quick. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you know, things go wrong, obviously, on live TV. It does. Tell us a few things that happened. <laughs> I burnt many things. Okay. 
uh, burnt many things, but there's always um, something which is made earlier by the food uh -huh. Uh -huh. assistant. That happens, and then um, Akis, who's another ready, steady cook, share, uh, okay. he's but he's done so many things. <laughs> that things happen, but I think uh -huh. because you just have to forget what's happened and ignore and start something else. And I've sliced my finger many times, you know, I've yeah. done that, and not only me, but many other chefs and the contestants. Uh -huh. But I just think you just have to. Just get um, on you want to win, right? <laughs> you want to win that ready, steady cook. Absolutely. So tell us what it's like. I mean, you've worked with the Hairy Bikers, you worked with Rick Stein, Rylan. Um, tell us a few anecdotes and tell us what it's like working with them. <laughs> I think, um, I mean, especially I mark, work more with Jamie Oliver now because Jamie. I just mm -hmm. think that Jamie is one of the kindest, one of the most amazing person, really? most mm -hmm. kindest chef around who really helps. His team really helps everyone. Um, Harry Bikers, I've worked, they're brilliant because they're really funny. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Rick Stein and Jack, Jack is my friend, Rick's son. Mm -hmm. So I've done many things with them. But I just think that um, sometimes people, chefs want to learn from you what you bring to the plate and you want to learn from the other chefs. Mm -hmm. I think it's that what you learn. Yeah. So where do you go out for your... You know, when you want to eat out, what's your... In London? What's, what's your choice? Uh, anyway. I practically live in London, but I live in Southwest. I, I come here quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, um, for me, I, 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 I love going to Hoppers, um, mm -hmm. you know, Shri and Lankan also food. Pali Hill, mm -hmm. which is, again, a very much Karnataka vibe on the... Um, near mm -hmm. Charlotte. I love going to little places. Mm -hmm. Or uh, Gunpowder, okay. um, things like that. Yeah, in uh, okay. Cyrus and Praveen, that place is mm -hmm. no more. They've moved somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. If I want to Indian, then I'll eat that. I need to go the to South, Wembley, right? South, South Asian, yes. <laughs> well, you've got a variety there. Yeah. yeah. And uh, what do you cook at home? What's your comfort food? Cheese and toast. <laughs> oh, cup of it. chai. Has to be a nice cup of chai. Mm -hmm. It's had Bengali chai, not Punjabi chai. Less milk. Mm -hmm. Less milky, um, but cheese and toast with a little chili flakes. It's my go-to. I think Perfect. it's the comfort food I... <laughs> I enjoy because after cooking so many hours. Perfect. You know, yeah. So we were talking about your fantasy dinner list. So tell them about it. It's a fantastic list. So listen on. <laughs> I have, I've, I've written an article for Financial Times. It's, it's, it, I don't know if you read if it's called a fan, fantasy dinner. Um, so you invite whoever, living or dead. So I don't know if many people know Honey and Co. They ha they're called Sir Sarit and Itimar. They're the brilliant chefs here. Um, so I would take them because my grandma and mom is no more, so they'll cook with me. But Anthony Bourdain is going to come because he's six foot four. He's going <laughs> to take the mangoes from the trees, pluck them. And then I don't know if you know Amrita Preetham. She's one of the most amazing. She's no more, long time ago dead. And she's an amazing poet and novelist. And she's written many, many uh, screenplays as well. So she will be telling us stories. as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Strong feminist, okay, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And Kapil Dev. I don't know if you Indians grew up with cricket. I love cricket. I played cricket. Uh, I still play cricket. And my really? daughters dislike cricket. Are you, uh, a, are you a batsman? Or batsman no, or I, I, I'm a off. I'm a both all rounder, but okay. I am an off spinner. So I, I'm quite good at cricket. Okay. Uh, so Kapil Dev is going to come and teach us cricket. Mm -hmm. um, that's it. That's my fantasy dinner written for Financial Times. And you're a great admirer of Amrita Pritham. I love And you're going to do a Great Lives on her. Yes, uh, BBC, um, uh, BBC Radio 4, they do this program called Great Lives. So I'm talking about Amrita Pritham. I think mm -hmm. she was just amazing character and such mm -hmm. brilliant, um, you know, people who don't know would go and find more about her. She has some amazing poems. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's great Spinter, that you, yeah. are, you, know, you are introducing her on, on this. So. Right, so tell us what's coming next. Are we going to see a Romy Gill television show, cookery show? Or no, no, I leave it to other people. Yeah. I, I, quite, yeah. I like radio. I like documentary. So yeah. I, 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 do, I like prefer, do, if, I, if you know a food program, I do a lot of documentaries mm -hmm. through, through food. Mm -hmm. I prefer doing that. I like radio than television. Mm -hmm. I do it because book sells. Mm -hmm. Television, uh, book sells and you get more opportunities. But I prefer mm -hmm. radio. Right. Radio is mm -hmm. something I think more I connect more mm -hmm. um, so I do a lot of radio so I'm doing the if anybody anyone knows I'm a judge on radio for food program anyone knows who are really brilliant street food nominate them or your food producers nominate those people mm -hmm. that's awards are open at the moment if you want to open that um, okay. and book I will I will be writing more books but mm -hmm. not yet okay you said you were going to do three parts so is there another area that you want to travel to 
you don't want your dog um, to it. <laughs> I, there would be another Himalayan trail, a um, um, uh, few more Himalayan trails, but um, I can't say much because publishers will kill sure, me. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Well, we look, we look forward to you know, reading more Himalayan trail because there's a lot there. There's a yes. lot of mountain to There go. is lots of mountain <laughs> covered from one part mm -hmm, to the mm -hmm. northeast. Mm -hmm. And in, you know, you were telling me this lovely story of your childhood that um, you loved Bengali food and you wanted to eat fish and you would go to your friends' houses. So let's share that um, story. So my, my, my parents' food was mostly Punjabi, like dal and sabji, like a vegetarian dish, a roti, a pickles and chutney. But my next door neighbors are my friend. Um, they eat Bengalis, eat a lot of fish every day. They'll have one piece and then lentils and other things. Chorchari paja, which is like a gre collard greens and other things. So I would go to the next door house and say, my mom hasn't fed me. And then I would eat that dinner too. Um, so I love food. You can see me, I love food. <laughs> food, food is so important. Don't we all? How old were you when you came here? 22. And were you already in cooking at that time? I was. I was a little bit cooking. Mm -hmm. um, more, more of more historian kind of understanding of history of uh, Indian food. Mm -hmm. But then I kind of went to, I wrote to many chefs to kind of, uh, if you want to, if anybody, I think hospitality industry, I have to tell one thing, is the most welcoming industry in the world. There are, there are a lot of bad things about it, is sometimes bad press, but I think it's one of the most welcoming industry. You can start from the bottom and then you can move up the ladder, which I did, you know? That's really Which is, I think, really <coughs> kind of important to do that. But one needs mentors, right? I mean, oh, oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you were lucky, you had some. Yeah, I have a mentor which was Cyrus and Praveen Todiwala. I don't know if you know oh, any, yes, anyone yes, know. Yes, and then yes. Atul Kocher. Okay. He really helped me quite a lot. Mm -hmm. So there, um, there are, um, I mean, a lot of men has helped me in my career, to be that's, honest. And they're because really that at point, mm -hmm. there were a lot of male chefs. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of women chefs are coming. They are wonderful. Yeah. So when I opened the restaurant, I was the first female Indian chef to run and open a restaurant. My husband didn't have anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. So I think now there are lots of Indian women who are opening it and doing wonderful things. I think that, um, mm -hmm. that is very important. And yeah. I think you need to have a mentor, definitely. Yeah. Mentors are very important. Yeah. Well, you you know, lucky. So lots of people here might want to write books. I mean, what is your advice? Or start restaurants or, you know, go in the food business? Right, writing but restaurants, I think, firstly, is about mentoring, like you've already said about it. I think writing, um, it's a very clique group. So you have to understand writing is very, very, if you who you know, who you don't know. So I think one thing you should never give up is you should write to people, there will be somebody in the right mind say, okay, write for me, can you mm -hmm. write this? Mm -hmm. And also recipes, if you want to write a book, you have to make sure you're weighing. Many Indians don't at home never weigh their things, they just chuck everything in. Mm -hmm. So when you're writing a recipe, it's one teaspoon or five teaspoons, make sure you weigh everything up. And nowadays, everybody, because your book goes America or Australia, where they like grams. So make sure you're measuring in grams. So you, you're kind of documenting your recipes. That, sure. I think, is very important. That's important. So how much time do you spend actually? Like, you know, you've been to Kashmir, you've seen them cook it. You come back and you have to duplicate it this. took me two years, the COVID. This Just book the, was written in the time oh, of pandemic. Right, yes. right. So then you have to break it down, measure it up, do it everything, your way. Yeah, everything. Yeah. Because you can't get up and this recipe belongs to somebody else who's I've eaten that food mm -hmm. and they've given me that recipe. I have to do the test it mm -hmm. before I can write about it, you know? Yep. So it took a lot of, out of me, yeah. And often you need substitutes because you yes. may not get it here. So it's really handy They use this coxcomb flower, which, yep. um, which is quite difficult to get here, but there is a coxcomb in this country which can be grown, which is from Africa, but you can use that in your cooking. So you can substitute yeah. with and that. And that's really handy. You know, you always write the substitutes yes. in your cooking because that, you know. I make sure yeah, in all my yeah. recipes, my mm -hmm. first book as well, I have everything, even if I'm writing recipe for any publications, you have to tell them that you can substitute this with this. This is the substitute, yeah. right. So I'm going to also open up for a few questions from the audience. Anyone wants tips on cooking? Anyone? <laughs> we have a hand straight up, right. Hi, hi from BBC Morning Live. Oh. I go on it sometimes. This is the uh, Morning Live team oh, over here. There we go. Saturday afternoon live. Um, thank you very much. Uh, that's lovely. Well, thank you so much for, for such a great talk. Um, I wanted to know about how you approach a classic recipe, like your butter chicken. It's amazing. It's totally delicious. It's responsible for several kilos of mine. But what do you... <laughs> 
how do you approach that when there are so many versions, there are so many recipes? Are you looking for an authentic thing or are you looking for what your perfect imagined version? How, how do you do that? Thank you. Um, as a butter chicken, I think I'm quite famous, be became famous because of Brady Steady Cook, but I did a treat version on it because I didn't have cashew nuts. Uh, so I did, a, I did with cream, everything else was there, and you can make it with that. But I learned from the right person, which is Chef Gill, Manjeet Gill, mm -hmm. who is the ITC head. Everybody in India who is in the hospitality worships him as a god. Um, he, he is a very, very renowned chef. Uh, so he, ITC, um, he took me to Moti Mehal, who actually started the, the butter chicken, the original butter chicken. Oh, yeah. So I've learned from the right person. So there are many versions around, which is fine. You can do your authentic version. But um, I, I did the cheat on, on, on a Ready Steady Cook, we became very famous. But you can do that. I think the original ones have onions and tomatoes and everything they use. But ITC doesn't use uh, onions, they use the cream as the base, tomato puree. Um, they use ginger garlic, so it's a bit, bit different. But I think one thing which is very important is fenugreek leaves, which is dried methi. That's very, very important. And the cardamom, the green cardamoms. The crushed green cardamoms, which gives you the sweetness, Ooh, there we the are. flavor. <laughs> so I think that is very. But you can make so many versions. I think just do my cheat version. That's the best. Yes, it has. Yes, it is the best one. That's the right one. <laughs> so what's your web, what's your website? So they all know. Uh, it's romigill.com. Romigill.com. Perfect. Are you going to make it for me then? <laughs> oh well. <laughs> <laughs> we could do a challenge in morning live. Tomorrow morning, wouldn't that be fabulous? Uh, I, will, I will ask the producers because obviously yeah. no one's going to expect it's going to be embarrassing for me no matter what happens. So that's an amazing thing. Uh, yeah, lovely. Thank, Thank you. you. So, talking about uh, chicken, um, sorry, butter chicken, we have to talk about the famous chicken tikka masala. So, tell us what you think about it. <laughs> I think, um, do you know what, um, I, I, honestly, I, I have to tell you one thing. When I, when I came to this country, when the food, you know, you, we have to understand 10, 10 pints of lager and a curry mm -hmm. is because I'm here. If those, cu if those um, curry houses did not exist, I wouldn't be here today. Madhu Jafri didn't come on television, I wouldn't be here today. So these people have paved the path for people like me and for you know, generations are going to come. So tikka masala has become wonderful. Why not? It gives Indian people up there. Put it up there. Why not? Why well, people love it? Mm -hmm. Of course. So I think that chicken tikka masala is the nation's dish. Why yeah, not? Dish, yeah. <laughs> Anything that, you know, anything that works. If yes. you like it, that's fine. Food is something that yeah. is very subjective. It's very mm -hmm. personal. You know, mm -hmm. it's your choices that won't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's one thing I noticed. There's very few chicken dishes in, in this book. And is there a reason for that? They don't eat chicken hardly. I only ate chicken um, once in somebody's house. And then I made one version for everybody who gets the book and buys the book. And they can make it at home. It's a whole roasted chicken. Mm -hmm. But... Um, so they eat sheep, so they don't eat the sheep, mutton of, you know, the, they don't eat the lamb, they eat mm -hmm. the sheep. Mm -hmm. um, it's bizarre, and they don't eat the goat. Oh, they don't eat so goat? So they don't eat oh. goat. Oh, okay. So it's, it has to, the mutton has to be from the sheep. Right. That's so Very, very, um, yeah, that's what I learned. Oh, that's interesting. Sorry, I'm talking too much. If there are any more questions, any recipes you need to know, any tips? <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm familiar, I'm trying to do because I always thought of myself. Uh, as a double migrant as well. I'm a Kashmiri who grew up in Calcutta and is now in London. Yeah. And I'm quite fascinated. Uh, you know, we keep talking about authentic food uh, of, a, of a particular community. But of course, lots of communities are in movement, like we are yeah. all migrating. Yeah. Have you ever sort of come across somewhere where like a cuisine is transported from one place to another and then it sort of takes on the, you know, it takes on the characteristics of the host country yeah. or the host community? Uh, for example, uh, our, um, uh, although I'm, I think ethnically I'm Kashmiri, we migrated about four or five centuries ago. So our food is, um, and, and we worked in the Mughal courts, a lot yes. of, our, yeah, so, so it's, it's Mughlai, but without onion and garlic. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. I mean, that, uh, this bit doesn't get, did you come across it in Kashmir at all? I mean, I did, I did, I came with the Kashmiri pundits. 
they don't use any any onions. They don't use shallots. Uh, nothing like that. They use a lot of asphodita, yeah. which is hing. And apparently, I was told it's an aphrodisiac, so use less of it. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so use that. They use a lot of ginger powder. Again, the reason for ginger powder is because of the climate in Kashmir. It's very harsh climate, and sometimes in winter you might not be able to get it. So you, they use a lot of ground ginger. And then, um, the, but there is Muslim communities. They use garlic and shallots, which is the pran. But that's the different things I, I got. But also the Kashmiris, eat, Hindus eat a lot of yogurt. You know that they use a lot of yogurt yeah. in their cooking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'm talking about the, like the, the migrants who are not living in Kashmir anymore. They're, they're oh, part, um, the reason I, I mean, I have lots of friends who has, um, is Pratik, one of the amazing chefs, is one of the 50 best restaurants in Asia, his restaurant in Mumbai, but he's moved on from there. He's a Kashmiri Pandit who's moved to Mumbai. His parents are in, in Delhi, and they've kind of taken the food from those. And, yeah. and his mom, one of his recipes in the book is from his mom. So he's taken the morals. Morals are picked, the mushrooms, which are picked by the, one of the most expensive ones in Kashmir, again, you find, and the Bakarwals, who are the shepherds, they pluck them. And then he's created this recipe, again, in, in a very different way that the Kashmiri, he's taken the Kashmiri and Mumbai culture together and mixed it. So it's, yeah. it's wonderful. Oh. It's a, it, and my oh. first book, Zaika, is all about Bengali and Punjabi cuisine. Oh. So I mix the punch foreign with Punjabis because that's how I am. I use my head of a Bengali and uh, strength of a Punjabi. <laughs> That's so uh, Zaika was a vegan. It is vegan. It's a vegan cookbook. Yeah. It is because my what mom was vegan. Uh, my my mom practically cooked vegetarian and vegan book. I'm a, uh, a cook, uh, so she. That's why I wanted to kind of share with people that. Indian food is practically vegan. Not everybody eats meat every day. Um, and even if they eat meat, there is a lot of other things on a thali that is very important part of the meal. Um, so processed food in India, we didn't do when I was growing up what was processed food and what was